Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Khuram Nasir. I'm one of the associate editor at Jack, and I am delighted to be joined today by Dr. Michael Koren, the lead author of a compelling new study just published in Jack simultaneously with, along with their late breaking clinical trial presentation at ACC. Uh, his team led the pursuit trial. Uh, a phase two study evaluating AZD0780 on once daily oral PCSK9 inhibitor with its novel mechanism and promising lipid lowering efficacy. This agent could mark an important step forward in the management of hypercholesterolemia. Um, I think the potential here is big, not just from a clinical perspective, but also from a patient access and adherence standpoint. So Mike, uh, thanks again for joining us and congratulations to you and your team on a well-rounded and highly relevant trial. Well, thank you, Karam. Thank you for that great introduction. Well, uh, Mike, before we dive deep, deeper, could you briefly walk us through the design of the pursuit trial and what do you see as the key findings? Uh, what about safety? And from your team's perspective, what's the main takeaway clinicians should remember? Sure. So the pursuit study was a phase two study of AZD0780, which is an oral, highly bioavailable PCSK9 inhibitor. And the concept here is to help more people get to their LDL goal using a simple, well-tolerated therapy. As you know, just in terms of background, we've had PCSK9 inhibitors on the market in the United States for 10 years, but people are still not getting to goal. You know, we all know lower is better, but when you actually look at epidemiological data or even studies that we've done where patients know what their LDL cholesterol is, they're still not getting to goal because of all the implementation reasons that we have, the difficulty getting these products, and the fact that we can't deploy them at the point of contact the, the way we used to. I'm a little bit older than you, but uh, I don't know if you remember the days when you had your statins in your drug closet in your office, and you looked at a patient in the eye and said, oh my God, your LDL is 150, we need to get that down to 70. Take this and take this piece of paper and go to your pharmacy and get your LDL down. And there was that sense of, of excitement and compelling people to get to that goal. And they came back six weeks later and their LDL was 70. Well, unfortunately, in the current environment, we don't do that. We don't give people a piece of paper anymore. We send it into cyberspace and we can't give people samples easily for the PCSK9 inhibitors. So what happens, they come back now, we're so booked out that they come back in three months and I look at their LDL and it's still 150 because of all the issues with, with implementation science. So I think what we're ultimately trying to do is create products that get a little old school, that we can you know, be able to ultimately give people these products at the point of contact, make the case of how important it is right in front of the doctor about getting that LDL below goal, whether it's uh, the goal of 70 or even a more aggressive goal of less than 55 milligrams per deciliter and explain why to do that and then make it happen. So that, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. And so for this particular study, again, pursuit study, phase 2B study, 12-week study, primary endpoint was LDL lowering at 12 weeks compared with baseline compared to placebo. It was a dose finding study, which is how most phase two studies are set up, as you know, looking at AZD doses from one milligram up to a maximum of 30 milligrams. And we found a nice dose response curve. And at 30 milligrams of AZD 0780, we found a 50.7% reduction in LDL compared to placebo. So we had an order of magnitude of the LDL reduction, pretty typical of what we expect for a PCSK9 inhibitor. The mechanism of action of this drug is a little bit different than the others, and I'm happy to get into that. But in this very early study, we found that this oral drug was very, very well tolerated. 95% of people in the study were able to complete the study on medication. We didn't see any dose-related side effects or dose-limiting toxicities in the study. And at the end of the day, we had a really nice effect on top of statin therapy. I should mention the fact that everybody started the study with an LDL between 70 and 190, and people were on either moderate or high-intensity statins at the start of therapy, somewhere on azetamibe. So um, on top of those therapies, this drug worked quite well. And we're hoping that in the future, having a simple-to-use product that may be co-administered with a statin at the point of contact will make a big difference and get to more compliance with ACCAHA guidelines and ultimately reduce um, cardiovascular complications in high-risk patients. 
Well, uh, thanks, Mike. One thing that really caught my eye, and you briefly did mention that the mechanism here is unique. The AZT0780 doesn't block the PCSK9 LDL receptor interaction directly, but rather affects the lysosomal trafficking. Now, for those like me who aren't molecular biologists, can you help mm -hmm. unpack what that sure. means in practical term? And does it open a door to a new generation of lipid lowering mechanisms? Well, it, it inhibits the the effects of PCSK9, which uh, in general, the the way PCSK9 reduces LDL clearance is by preventing LDL receptors from recycling to the surface of hepatocytes, where they remove LDL cholesterol from the circulation. So in the absence of a PCSK9 inhibitor, you have a lower density of LDL receptors on hepatocytes. So all the PCSK9 inhibitors work by a similar mechanism of allowing enhanced recycling of those LDL receptors. So there's more LDL receptors to capture LDL and get out of the circulation. So the net effect of AZD0780 is very similar to Evolocumab or Alarocumab and the other PCSK9 inhibitors. But as you point out, it doesn't do it at the level of preventing binding of the PCSK9 to the LDL receptor. It does it at the level of the trafficking of the complex between PCSK9, LDL, and the LDL receptor and does not cause lysosomal degradation of that complex. Instead, the LDL receptor is able to recycle back up to the surface of the hepatocyte and pull out more LDL. So again, net effect is very similar to other PCSK9 inhibitors. The details of the mechanism are a bit different. Got it. Now, of course, one of the key things is for me in this 12 week, uh, overall the safety looks pretty clean, but again, this is a short trial, right? What do you think needs to happen next to really build the confidence in the long-term tolerability or potentially other unintended side effects? Yeah, as you know, a, a big purpose of phase two is to one, pick the dose for phase three and to make sure phase three makes sense in terms of whether or not this product should be developed. So, you know, it's very expensive developing these products and companies have to make that decision based on phase two information. And I would say that there's a pretty good level of confidence that this, this drug will get into more extensive phase three testing where we'll look to see what happens in terms of a longer period of time, not just 12 weeks, but going out a year, two years and making sure the safety and tolerability are as good as we saw within 12 weeks to extend the type of patients that we're looking at over the course of phase three and ultimately make the decision whether or not um, this uh, this effect on LDL is sustained over time without any kind of tolerability or safety problems. But so far, so good. In, in the early studies, we're not seeing any dose-related side effects. So in some studies, you'll see, for example, more LFT abnormalities as the dose goes up. We're not seeing anything like that. We're not seeing more muscle problems as the dose goes up. We're not seeing anything like that. So there's no dose-limiting toxicities to date based on the data that we, that we looked at in the PURSUIT study. Got it. So, you know, Mike, one thing that app was obviously well discussed during the review and, of course, also with an internal consultation and the reviewers was you took a slightly different approach to efficacy measurement using mm -hmm. a hypothetical estimate as the primary endpoint. That's some not something we commonly see lead a lipid trial. Can you talk about why that choice was made? What sure. signal you hope to send to the research community and how was your conversations with the regulatory bodies around that? Well, to start with the end of that question, I was not part of the discussion with oh, the sure. regulatory bodies. Okay. Uh, I'm the independent investigator and the, my sure. other investigators work for AstraZeneca, but sure. I'm the, the clinical trial independent guy that, that was involved in the studies. And it, it's actually a little bit more common than you think in early phase studies. So the, all the statistical analysis concepts are based on the way you ask a question. So in this particular case, we wanted to know what the effect of the drug would be if taken the way it was intended to be taken and background therapy wasn't changed. So it gets into the concept that we call the hypothetical estimate, which is a way of estimating that using regression statistics and models. And so that was the primary outcome. But 
a way that we do a sensitivity analysis or more specifically look at the robustness of the results is look at, quote, an on treatment analysis or we call a treatment policy analysis. So we actually did it both ways in, in this study. So although the primary analysis was this hypothetical estimate where the model is predicting what would happen if everybody took the medicine the way they were supposed to do and not change the background therapy, in the treatment policy analysis, we saw very similar results. So that was reassuring that both analyses basically gave us the same concept. And again, as far as the FDA discussion, all these things, of course, are discussed with the F F uh, FDA beforehand, and all these statistics are pre-specified, and, and we do present the, uh, all this information in the manuscript. Got it. Now, I, I know you initially touched it on this top aspect, the next question I'm going to ask, but I really want to have a step back and do a little more detailed conversation. You know, we the obvious question is we already have powerful lipid loading tools, uh, e including orals, statins, azitamide, bimpedoica, I said new ones on the horizon, and of course the MABs and the inclerisins. And some people would ask, do we really need more? And I know you did respond to an option at the point of care. Maybe you can give them the medications, oral may be easier, but again, I think so you'll still have to go through um, the process, approval process, all the things that we face the challenges with, even with bimpedoic acid. So, and so far with all of these medications, the railroad uptake has been mixed as you pointed out. Now, what gap do you think AZT0780 is filling that current options aren't quite reaching? Sure. And that's a great question. And that's really the ultimate question is that we can have great products but if people have difficulty using them or clinicians are reluctant to prescribe them or the hassle factor is, is too great of a factor to overcome, then what good are the products? You know, to be blunt, you need, you need products that people actually take and we need to make it simple. So I like to call this implementation science. And so the, the, the drugs that are on the market right now are all parenteral drugs to, to inhibit PCSK9, whether it's an antibody or a small interfering RNA. And they're very effective. They're very effective. And if we know if people actually take them, they'll have really good results. But the truth is, in the United States, it's hard to get them. And it's hard to get people to take them. And this dynamic that I was describing to you in the beginning, that the, uh, the compelling urgency that comes from a cardiologist when you explain to a patient, hey, I'm really worried about your LDL, and I want you to take this now. You just can't do that with, with the injectables. We don't have any mechanism to do that. In fact, if we could do that, they would work really well. Uh, I published the was I uh, was the first author on the B Initiate study, which we actually published last year in JACC, and that was an interventional trial where we took 450 patients at representative sites just in the United States. We ran that randomized them to either usual care or to getting in clistrin immediately, and the people that were under usual care rarely got to their LDL goal, and 22% of those people got to LDL goal, despite the fact they were in clinics, but they had all the resources, we were telling them what their LDL was, we were telling them that they had coronary disease, we were telling them what their goal is, but they still weren't getting there. Whereas if we had the ability to inject them with glycerin right there and then, then we'd get their LDL down. So hopefully, if we have an oral product, and imagine, again, I can't speak for the company, but imagine if the oral co product was either co-administered or co-formulated with a statin, then literally we'd sure. have a pill that say, hey, you take this pill and we get your LDL down 70% or more. And again, you get back to that old school concept that at the time of the interaction with the physician, we're giving you the therapy and hopefully we're getting you on your way to get to the goals. And we all accept the fact that lower is better, but we're having a hard time getting lower. Perfect. You, you know, uh, since you talked about adoption, um, I'm sure you'll enjoy the accompanying editorial where such dilemmas were discussed. And of course, the pricing came out as one of a potential issue. And it could be a potential double-edged sword because uh, if the prices are lower, definitely helps the patients but and the payers, but could run into PBM issues. And uh, while the PBMs were designed to lower overall costs. You and I know that the system has established pervasive incentives promoting high cost drugs with substantial rebates on lower cost alternatives. Right. And right. the dilemma is that if this oral PCS canine inhibitor is introduced at a lower price with lower rebates, do you think it would render them less attractive? And what's your perspective and how do we balance affordability, access, and innovation on this 
specific issue? Yeah, it's a great question. And obviously, a lot of this is outside the clinical realm. Yeah. But what I would say is from a clinical perspective, let's design clinical trials that look at these issues. And so I'd be interested in just a clinical trial where I give somebody samples of drugs in my office and then I give, get them on a pathway to hopefully get them approved after that in initial therapy over a period of time uh, versus the way we do things currently and see what happens after three months, six months, and 12 months, who's actually at goal. And I'm going to guess that if we make the implementation concept much simpler, we're going to get much better results. And that should be calculate in terms of the overall cost of how to do things. So imagine if we do one dose titration versus several dose titrations like you do now. So for example, as you know, in order to get advanced therapy, you have to prove over and over again that somebody really needs it versus just saying, oh, hey, you know, your, your LDL to start is 160. We got to get you down to 55. There's no way this is going to happen without dual therapy and let's just go for it. So let's start talking about implementation science. And I think when we look at that, you'll look at cost in a different way. And you'll look at cost um, in terms of what it takes to get people to goal, which is a different metric than what we usually talk about in most studies. So I'm hopeful, actually, that we can design clinical trials that look at this concept of implementation science, and that will guide the payers on how to deal with the negotiations between the payers and the manufacturers. Great thoughts. I, I I couldn't agree more. I think so. It's time for the industry, the health system, the peers, and everyone coming together to design not only looking at efficacy but also from a pragmatic landscape. But Mike, thank you so much. This was a blast. Now, really appreciate you walking us through the science. I would say the unique aspect, but more importantly for our viewers, the big picture. Mm -hmm. It's rare we get to talk about something that could be both clinically meaningful and I would say a system-wide disruptive, and this may be just one of those moments. And uh, of course, we'll definitely be following it next, but I wanted to give you a chance if there were any other thoughts or messages that we didn't cover. Yeah, again, it's early on in development of this product, but from what I'm seeing so far, I'm very hopeful. And as you and I discussed, hopefully future research will look at more diverse patient populations and specifically address the implementation science, which is what's necessary to get our patients lower than they are now. And we know lower is better. Perfect, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you have a chance to read the paper and the accompanying editorial in detail to get a much deeper uh, dive into all these aspects. Thank you again. My pleasure.